Great. Well, I want to start something that I've been looking forward to for months, and that is the subject of one-on-one discipleship. This is something that we need to have our minds renewed in. We have been programmed to function a certain way in church for years, and we're reaping a lot of the fruits of our program behavior, and all, not all of it is good. So Wednesday night, I had a whiteboard. I'm going to grab it here in a minute. And we went through with the Wednesday night crew and had a very interactive time. And we're going to do that this morning. So I want to hear you talk. We're going to have a great time together. Lauren's going to try to keep up for you guys online. So let's put Matthew 4, 19 on the screen. We know this verse. It's a familiar verse to us. When Jesus, in his original calling of his disciples, said, come follow me and I'll show you how to what? Fish for men or fish for people. This is a very basic thing that we all learned in children's church, in children's ministry. But the reality is, how many of us function this way in terms of our relationship, our following of Jesus? Are we fishing for people? Are we actively engaging with the lost? Are we actively drawing people to the Lord and discipling them? The other scripture that's very basic, we all learned in children's church, is Matthew 28, 19, which says, therefore, go and make what? Disciples of all the nations. So we can say this, we can quote this, but if I was to do a poll this morning, Very few hands would be raised if I asked you how many of you are fishing for people and making disciples. Very few hands would go up. We have created in the church a model that allows you to be in Christ, a mature believer, someone that is respected in the Lord, that's been sitting in church for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and you've never led anyone to the Lord. And you've never discipled anyone. But at the very core of Jesus' message was, hey, if you're going to follow after me, then you're going to fish for people, because that's what I'm all about. And we're going to, as a group, as a movement, go into the world and make disciples. So Jesus couldn't have been more clear. But then you look at the modern American church, and you see a church that's not doing virtually either one. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about pastors. I'm talking about the people, the church. We have a serious dilemma. We're wondering why we're losing so many of our young people. We're wondering why the darkness is so increasing in the land and, and we can't seem to you know, retain our majority or our influence and sin is increasing. We have strayed from the very foundation of all that Jesus has taught to us. One thing that's influenced that has been the raise your hand and accept Christ, right? You've all heard the altar calls. In the emotion of the moment, raise your hand, accept Christ. You want to be saved from your sins. That has done a lot of negative for the church because we've convinced people that they're saved if in an emotional service they raised their hand they want to follow God. But they never really got converted and they were never discipled and they left and nothing ever happened. That's why one time, sometimes you'll, you'll hear me in an altar call situation Ask for people to raise their hand if they want to accept Christ. If someone raises their hand, I'll ask them to see me at the altar afterward. Do you realize that most people don't come to see me? I'm not interested in making you all pray a prayer. I'm not interested in tricking or deceiving that person into thinking they're saved. I want to say, is the Spirit of God stirring in your heart? Raise your hand. And if he is, come see me afterwards. Very few people come. But again, do you realize some of the ways we function in church, we've set people up for this type of non-committed, go through the motions, Christianity. Go and make disciples of all nations. Church, we need a mind renewing. We have truly made it possible that we can sit in church, that we can go through the motions and never do this. Am I right? You know what I'm talking about. So this is a serious issue, serious issue for us. 
because we're struggling. The church is struggling in America. So we're called to make disciples. I'm not going to be able to probably angle this so everyone can see. So we'll do something like this. I want to ask you the question, how are disciples made? So this is a kingdom question. So you're going to tell me everything that the full spectrum, what the church is currently doing, what the church isn't doing. How are disciples made? Shout it out. Clayton. Starts with the Bible. So scripture. Okay. What else? Okay. So we'll just say the good news. What else? Okay, testimonies. Tell you what, let's lump that in here. So let's do good news slash testimonies. You'll notice my handwriting will get continually worse. One on one. What else? Prayer. What else? Teaching. Teaching. What else? Candy. Commitment. Okay. I like the commitment and time's good. I don't know if I spelled that right or not. Commitment slash time. Yes. Telling people to go to church, excellent. Let's, uh, let's rephrase that as, uh, let's just put church. Church is important. What else? Excellent. I can get that down here. I need a bigger whiteboard. A smaller writer. Chuck. Relationships. There we go, small. Relationships. What else? Okay, life together. Let's do one-on-one -on -one slash life. What else? Sharing knowledge. Okay, yep, so let's do teaching. Uh... Let's do um, teaching slash, like, mentor. What else? Loving people. Good one. And that really goes with the time thing. To have the ability to love someone needs to give them the time, right? What else? Evangelism, so we got good news. We'll lump that under that. That's good. Anything else? Okay. This is a good list. Now, let me ask you, as I did Wednesday night, how are we doing at these? So let's go through them one by one. So scripture, the Bible, we need to be in the scripture ourselves, right? It's living, it's active, it's alive and it's what really transforms our life by the renewing of the mind and everything of that so the scripture so this is something that I need to be doing individually so that I'm personally strong at and then I need to have this element that I know the word and the word comes out of me and, and God just scripture is, is a part of who I am in the American church how are we how are you in terms of of being strong in the scripture because remember the scripture is part of making a disciple are we good are we bad or are we in the middle someone give me an estimate what the, what do you think, I think we're fair. okay so we're kind of fair okay so um we'll put a little check here we're all right how about good news and sharing our testimony how are we, how are you at sharing Christ 
out in the workplace with your family, how are you? Okay, we got a great. Okay, let me ask the question this way. How is the American church at this? Okay, I would agree that we're, we're not very good. So let's just take and cross that out. We're not functioning very well here. How about one-on-one and living life together? So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Have you ever, one-on-one, been mentored or discipled by somebody? Okay, have you ever been pulled aside and had somebody say, I want to pour into you? Now, are you actively looking for God connections for somebody that God might have you be meeting with one-on-one? How is the church at large in America doing with this one? Poor, right? Very, very bad. Um, We're very individualistic people, and we tend to stick to ourselves. So one-on-one, we're not doing well at as the corporate overall church. Now, how about prayer? Prayer in terms of you personally being a person of prayer. Prayer in terms of the church teaching people how to pray. Just excelling in prayer. Prayer being an emphasis because we know that through prayer we fellowship with the Father and through that fellowship we're made into a disciple. How are we doing in terms of prayer, the American church? Okay, we got fair. Awesome. Okay, people pray when they want something. Okay. Put it on the fence. Okay. Um, I would tend to put a cross through here. I would would cross this out if I was going to personally state this. We're a prayerless church. In general, we are not functioning well in prayer. We do pray when we need something. So there's a lot of prayer that happens. So we'll, we'll put this on the fence. We'll give ourselves a little bit of benefit of the doubt. Now, how about teaching? How about mentoring? How about this component of teaching the scriptures? Do you teach people the scripture? Do you open up the scripture? Are you transferring and teaching to somebody else? You got head shaking, no. Head shaking, no. 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 Okay, so we're going we're gonna to say, hey, the church is not really mentoring and the church is not really teaching. Pastor's doing it. But Jesus' followers, in terms of going out into the world and creating a movement of teaching and mentoring, we're not really doing that. Okay, so how about commitment and time? We're poor. You guys agree with that? The American Christians, fairly uncommitted, kind of like elevating sports, elevating this. Church is the last thing. God's the last thing. It's fit into my life when it's convenient. Okay, so we got to cross through that. Now, how about this, this dovetails that church? Okay, I'm going to say we're fair at this. I, I think we're fair. A lot of you guys are really committed. American t- church in terms of like overall, eh, it's not a great thing, but it's not horrible. We still have people coming to church every Sunday. So we'll, we'll do a, a check here. How about example? Now, this is being real Monday through Friday, right? This is being the real deal. 24-7, how are we as American church with hypocrisy? Because that's what we're talking about. We stink. What else do you think? We're on the fence? No? Okay, so now we're differentiating between us, the men from the boys. We're going to give ourselves a check. We're in the middle. We're decent but we could improve. Okay? How about with relationships? Are we a relational church in terms of spiritual relationship? Not talking totally natural, but spiritual because we're trying to make a disciple. Do we have relationships that are spiritual, that relationships that help make disciples? And it doesn't have to be intentional, but just a spiritual relationship that I'm... My relationship is built on spiritual things. Let's put it that way. It's not like the hunting buddy or whatever. It's, It's... not the golfing buddy, but it, it's just a relationship where we talk about Jesus. Are we good at that? Okay, kind of goes back to the one-on-one. I agree with that. So some of us excel. Some of us don't. Okay, so let's just we'll put a little check because there's kind of back and forth. Now, how are we at love, showing love and care when we see our brother hurting? 
well, let's say in general, the overall American church, because we do a good job with that here. But let me ask you this. We do it good as an organization, but how do we do it as a people? Thanks to Dixie and Caring Heart Ministry, the organization does a good job. But what about you as a person? Seeing your neighbor, seeing him in need, and functioning with a heart of love to, you know, take the shirt off your back, so to speak, and give it to him. Okay, so the American people stink. But you know what? I want to give us a check because I think there's a, I think there's a, a good solid core that are pretty strong. That's a great question. Um, how is there homeless if there's a good solid core functioning in love? Sure. They seem to be there. But how are we not sharing on a daily devotional the love to the neighbor? Sure. So the question for those online is how can there be homeless down in the streets of Harrisburg and so forth that that we're completely basically turning a blind eye to? We don't have anything organized to reach out to them. We're not as an individual going to them. So again, the check mark is not like a star. I'd say like a star would be like this is like Excellent. We don't really have any of those on here. Okay, we do have people. I mean, I know Elder Greg spent, what, like half a day with that lady that had her car issue. I mean, he ended up going way out of his way. He showed tremendous love, fixed her car, and blessed her because he showed the love of Christ. And we have individuals that do that. But we have room to grow, so we got a little check mark. Okay, so we just did a real basic elementary just list. It's messy, but it works. It's cleaner up there. So we've looked through this, and we don't have anything that we're really excelling at. We're struggling. Yeah, Mike. Okay. 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 All right. Mike says we deserve more checks than that. Give yourself a round of applause. You know what? I agree with Mike. That's not to say that we don't have a lot of improvement to That's right. Comparing us to other sites. And in regards to the homeless, there is an awful lot of other churches that are doing more than we do. That's right. That's correct, from an organizational standpoint. So this is, this is more talking about the church, not as an organization, but as an individual. It's looking at you. So now, I agree with Mike, but I will say this. We all tend to have bias, and we like to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, which Scripture warns against that. And so this is really an exercise. We're saying, God, um, open the eyes of my heart. Sheila, or if you guys are able to throw up Psalm 119, 18, should be your last scripture there. This is our heart cry. When you come to scripture, I want to encourage you to memorize this verse because it's where the psalmist says, Lord, open my eyes to see. Because I see myself as real strong here. If I was to rate myself, I would be doing this. I would be saying, I'm going to give myself stars. And so the cry is, God, open my eyes to see the wonderful truths of your instruction and to teach me. This is a prayer that we need to be praying um, because we think we've arrived and God wants to take us clean over here. And so there's so much more to learn. We think we're a praying church because we pray seven days a week. But what does prayer really look like? Our seven day a week prayer might be prayers that are about me and that aren't really deep times of fellowship with the Father that I know how without worship music to enter into the presence of God. Do you know how to do that? If you don't know how, without worship music, with chaos happening, to quiet your mind and be before the Lord and sense his presence in your life, then you're really deficient in prayer. So there's a lot of times we think we're good and we're not. So God has a lot to do with us. So we're talking about something that's so foundational to the church. We went through this exercise 
But what we see when we begin to look at the church at large, and even in AHC, I love you guys. We're not, this isn't finger pointing. This is God reveal. Speak, God speak to us. We begin to realize that oftentimes we're living a pattern that doesn't fit with the scripture. Go and fish. Go fish and make disciples. Make disciples. So how effectively are we doing these? The answer is, if you go back to 28, 19, Matthew 28, 19, we're not doing that good. We're not doing that well. We're not actively and effectively making disciples. We're losing 75% of our young people to the world. We're not effectively making disciples and raising up the next generation. So now let's look at this scripture. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I give you, and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay, what are the four? <laughs> this isn't working too well. What are the four things this scripture says, the four actions? Yeah, I should try a tissue. That we're to do. So go back to verse 19. What are we to do? Am I going to be able to write on it after I get done? With it? Should have tried this. This is a new whiteboard. Should have tried this. Okay. Okay. Thank you, bud. <laughs> what are we to do? Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, I'm asking you the question, what are we to do? How do we make disciples? There's four things in this verse. Go. Okay, baptize. Okay, next verse. Teach. And what does a disciple need to do? They need to obey. Okay. So those are four things that Jesus in this command lays out. So go. That's an imperative command. You're to do it. You need to go and make disciples. We need a renewing of our mind. If I claim to follow Christ, I am not to function as someone that can just sit now because I back because I have life insurance from the Son of God Life Insurance Group. I am to be actively involved in making disciples. Right? Go and make disciples. So the go means I need to do it. I can't just sit in church. I can't just not do this. It's not optional. Go. 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 And make disciples. We need a mind renewing. 24-7. Not making disciples. That's not normal kingdom. We need a serious mind renewing baptizing. We baptize in the church. We baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We do that. That is important. It's a statement. It's very critical. Acts 2.38, if you put the scripture up, I want to show you. Peter, preaching at the day of Pentecost, says you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized. So it's very consistent with the teaching of Jesus. Teaching. You want to flip back to Matthew 28, verse 20. Jesus says to Go and teach. Teaching's critical. I want to come right back to teaching. And then obedience. Let's look at Luke 7, 46 to 49. I don't know if that's the scripture I want. Go to the next verse. That is not what I wanted, so we'll skip that. James 1, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. That's the obedience component. Otherwise, you're fooling yourself. We have a lot of people sitting in church in America that are fooled. A lot of people are fooled because they're not fishing for people, men and women, and they're not making disciples. So they're listening to God's word. They're hearing it, but they're fooling themselves. And so obedience is critical to the longevity of the kingdom, right? 
If I come and share the gospel with you and you don't do anything with it, what happens to the gospel? It dies right there. And so obedience is absolutely foundational to this kingdom that Jesus established. So these are the four things. Let's go back to Matthew 28, 20, which says to teach. How do we teach? That's a question. How do we teach? Who's to teach? Okay, all. Who else? Specifically. Okay, God, God does teach us. He has sent his Holy Spirit into the world to convict. Okay, so God is actively involved helping us. That's comforting. Okay, disciples, so we're going to put that into like the church concept. What? Okay, the elders, good. Elders have to be able to teach. Paul said the, the qualification of an elder is you need to be able to teach. What else? Parents, parents what? Teach who? Teach your children. What else? Pastors, right? So we see all kinds of teaching instructions in the scripture. I'll give you a couple. Ephesians 4.11. This is a famous passage with the five-fold ministry. This is where it says that Jesus, the Christ, gifts, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, and what? Teacher. So there's specific gifts that are teachers that help us fulfill the Great Commission. Titus chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. Let's look at this. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, older women should what? Teach others what is good. So there you see specific instructions to older women living a life that honors God and being able to teach. Then Colossians 3.16, similarly, Colossians 3.16, let the message about Christ in all its richness, richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other. That's the disciples. That's the all. That's the church. So we, when you look at the whole council of scripture, see that it communicates this message that I'm to be a teacher. Now there's distinct teachers, but in each role, whether I be a parent, an old woman, or just all, I'm to be teaching. I'm to be engaged in communicating and teaching the way of God. And so that's the pattern that is laid forth. Now let me ask you this. How do we teach? By example? I'm not going to fight the whiteboard, so I'll just hold my hand up. By example? Sharing his word. Okay, specifically teaching the scripture. What else? Okay, testimony. One on one. Okay, so we can teach like in this setting. I could teach to you from a pulpit or a classroom setting. We could run a Bible class that says how to study the Bible, right? And a bunch of you would sign up. You say, Pastor Tim, teach me how to study the Bible. That would be teaching, right? But then there's also one-on-one -on -one teaching where I pull someone aside and I say, hey, let's go through this study on deliverance because you're struggling with this past and you want deliverance. And so there's teaching that happens one on one. Now, which of the forms of these teaching has the church relied upon? The pastor. So we've narrowed this strategy of God down to just the pastor teaching, when in reality, the model has been that all disciples come and follow Jesus and become little mini teachers that are teaching and passing on, teaching and passing on. Now, what lie have you been told by the enemy? You're not good enough. You heard that one? Yep. I think every hand goes up. We've all heard that. Why have we heard that? Why has he spread that so effectively and worked so hard to make sure all here? Because it's the most effective when all of you are beginning to teach and function with this paradigm. If you believe the lie that you're not qualified and you're not good enough to teach, he has just silenced all of the church. Snuffed it all out. And now it's relegated to one 45-minute teaching session on Sunday morning. Which doesn't really amount to a hill of beans. Because you're struggling 
with depression. You're struggling with suicide. You're struggling with all that life throws at you. You have no idea what the Bible says about it, and you have no one to help teach you the truth about God. 45 minutes on Sunday morning doesn't work. Go into the world and make disciples by teaching. And so we have relied upon the pulpit, and we have believed this lie that I'm an introvert. I'm not like Pastor Tim. I don't have a degree. I don't know what to say. I was never discipled. I was never mentored. I can't do that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 is a key, key verse. For us to have, to renew our, renew our minds in this arena. This is Paul writing to Timothy. I want you to catch the four groups of people in this verse. The things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. What is the four groups of people there? Okay, we got many witnesses. Okay, reliable people. Uh, qualified is reliable, yep. Who are the other two people? So we got others, and we, got the, we have others, and we have qualified people. Okay, me. I don't, okay, who's me? Paul. I'm sorry. I'm saying I'm not up there. And Timothy. What do we see here in this progression? The things you have heard me, Paul, say to Timothy in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. So it's Paul to Timothy to reliable people to others. You catch that? Four progression. So Paul says the things I'm saying in this room aren't to stay in this room. That's what he's saying. The things that I've poured into you, Timothy, while we're going down the road, they're not to just stay with you. They're not to just die with you. You're to pass them to reliable people who are qualified to teach others. This is kingdom of God. Is this American church? No, it isn't. You're the Lone Ranger, man. Just figure it out on your own. And if you figure something out, the concept of passing it on is really foreign. I don't see a responsibility I don't see a need. I have a great relationship with this. Let's try my left hand. Okay. We'll try this again. Now I'm going to draw, and it's not going to be pretty, but it's going to make a point. Do you guys know why the Dead Sea is dead? Okay, so we've got the river coming down. And then what happens? It goes into this lake. We're going to call this the Dead Sea. It's dead. Why is it dead? Because there's nothing coming out. Okay, so the water's coming in. There's no water coming out. Then you have a normal sea or the Sea of Galilee where you've got the river and then you have the lake. And then you have the river, the stream continuing down. And this is alive. Now, which of these pictures illustrates you? I told you it'd be bad, so ignore that. <laughs> Looks like a stomach, okay, if you can't see it. The reality is, most of us look like this, where we have been for decades receiving, 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 and there's been no outflow, and so we're not, there's no disciple downstream, there's no teaching that's happening, it's all about me and whatever I can learn and, and somehow excel at. This is not a picture of what Jesus' kingdom is to be. This is because it's Paul to Timothy to reliable men to others, and it's a pass-through. 
and the kingdom continues to flow and it continues to prosper. The reason the church is taken off in other lands and in other nations and you see kingdom multiplication is because of this right here. Not this. This is American and this does not work. The concept that it's a pass-through is vital to the kingdom of God. You see in other foreign lands, somebody getting saved, and they become a pastor in a week or two because they're the first one saved in their village. No Bible training. No even ability to read the Bible in many cases. They just met Jesus. And so they say, you know what? I'm going to begin to tell you about my experience, and I'm going to pour in, and there's outflow that happens, and the kingdom goes, whoosh, takes off. In America, somebody comes to Christ, and we have this model that says, well, they're not good enough to teach, and we need to send them to Bible school, and they need letters behind their name, and, you know, I don't know they can go out and evangelize, because we need to go through these classes first, and we have this whole structure that creates a dead sea. Paul, who did Paul believe in? Paul believed in Timothy. Who else did Paul believe in? He also believed in the reliable men that he never met. And who else did he believe in? The others. He laid forth this model that says, hey, when you get something, you need to give it out. Remember Jesus said to the disciples when he sent them out, freely you've received, so freely give. We have a problem in the American church. A big problem in the American church. And so it's a, this systemic problem that is bearing really bad fruit in different ways. One, we see our numbers in decline rather than multiply, multiplying. We have young people that aren't being taught. We have young people that are not being mentored. There are some of you in here that would raise your hand and be like, mentor, disciple me. I want discipled. But we have a church that just continues to go through the motions and listens to pastor preach for 45 minutes on Sunday. Figure it out on your own. We have some big systemic issues, but praise God, he is wanting to transform us. Guys, AHC, I've said it before, you've heard me say it, is called, listen, AHC is called to be a marker church. What do I mean by that when I say that? It means we're called to leave behind the norm of all these other churches that are going through the motions and God's working there and I'm not putting them down. We can only be responsible for us. God is calling us to make a shift. God is calling you to make a shift in your life and the paradigm of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so we're going to begin to look at this the next couple of weeks and we're going to have some testimonies. We have some awesome grassroots stuff happening in terms of discipleship at this church. But do you realize that this is what's key to transforming our world? We don't need to get more people in here on Sunday morning to listen to me. I need Diane. I need Candy. I need Sally. I need Randy. I need, I need, God needs a church, a discipling church, a church that takes ownership in this thing and says, I'm going to be a vessel that God's going to use, and he's going to use me to touch my coworker and my neighbor because I'm going to enter into discipleship with them. There's a great renewing of our mind that's going to happen. So why don't you stand with me? This is just intro. This is just the teaser, so to speak. But really, my prayer for you guys is this. God, renew their minds. Speak to us and do a radical work in us. Transform who we are and how we think. And this is going to be tough for those of you that are Decaders, I just made up a word. You've been in the church for decades and in your rut for decades. And this is how you think. Big stuff you need to wrestle through. Fishers of men, disciplers. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this church and the time we've had just discussing these things. Lord, we only scratched the surface. But God, I pray that you would begin today a deep work in us transform our hearts Lord for some of us that means giving us a burden Lord to change our schedule and, and make time for others Lord it, it looks different it, it's gonna be unique for each of us but God I pray that work upon abundant harvest 
that you would transform our minds, that you prepare us to be vessels that love people and disciple people. Lord, that we would be a church that you can entrust and trust with people. Lord, the world is broken. It is broken. It's hurting. They don't need a good sermon on Sunday morning. We've been doing that for years. Lord, what they need is a believer to come alongside them and disciple them. So, Lord, we invite your work. We invite the new thing. Lord, that we would become this marker church, this church that leads out in this area. So, Father, do your work. Prepare our hearts and lead us into this call in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for each one here, for each one listening, tuned in on live stream. God, I thank you for the unity of the body of Christ. I thank you, God, for the strength of this church. Lord, I thank you for the future that is to come. Lord, unite our hearts. Unite our hearts, Lord. Meet every need. Strengthen your church. God, and lead us as we live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Listen, God bless you guys. Have a great week living for Jesus. You are dismissed.